Ab, again, Pema Junila Solowa, Adib, Dorji Chang Chitilo Narodang, Marpa Mila Gompotsatsapa, Na Pupadang Paldendrupa Sog, Kargulama Namla Solowa, Adib, O Chen Lama Namla Solwa Deb, Drochen Lama Namla Solwa Deb, Naginwari Lama Namla Solwa Deb, Shaki Lama Namla Solwa Deb, Nyandu Dang Yundran Lama Namla. Solohadeb, Palkondu Jangdang Yerme Pa, Gungarab Dorji Jintrag Pa, Jeti Dang Nisume Pa, Palamanam Chetinte Chong. To remind you all, the taking of refuge and the arising of Bodhisattva. It is the two, the key, to take refuge in beyond the beyond and to arise Bodhisattva, which is the vitality of that very beyond the beyond, its aliveness, its lucidity, its luminosity. Both those parts Denetro am kiang rung, to decide upon one thing, and one thing only, is the second vital part. Whether you are in a state of movement or stillness, remember me talking about that this morning, moving and stillness, whether you are tranced out in shine or distracted by thoughts, whether your focus is on movement or stillness, and you are in an either or state. Tunam chaksam kidam do, whether anger or attachment, happiness or sorrow, whatever feelings arise. Dunanikab tamche do, at all times in any situation whatsoever, at all times, in any situation. And the stressier the situation you can do it in, the better it works. The farther the gewa created by doing so carries you. You all know the word gewa? So, in Tibetan Dharma, there are two really important concepts, Gewa and Digpa. Digpa is a kind of stress and tightness that you share about, creating more stress and tightness. Sometimes someone tries very hard to be good, but it actually furthers the stress and tightness in the situation. So even though you are trying to perform a relaxation and openness because you don't have the hang of it. You create more stress and tightness. Sometimes they're translated as sin and virtue. Digpa being the equivalent of sin and Gewa being the equivalent of virtue. But that's a sticky wicket because it's nothing, nothing like the Catholic idea or the Christian idea or the Jewish idea or the Muslim idea. It's nothing like the monotheistic ideas of sin and virtue. So that translation is more likely to confuse you than help you. Gewa opens, relaxes, creates the joy and bliss of the union of love and emptiness. Gewa creates that, spreads that, furthers that. 
the fourth time where all sentient beings of the three realms arise as all Buddhas of the fourth time, beyond time and space, since there's a moment of enlightenment for every single entity. So in the actuality of that moment, we call it the fourth time beyond space and time. Points to that, affirms that, leads to that, causes that. Gewa, can you feel it? Digpa. Grinch, tightness, scrinch, and passing that around. When you're angry, and so you yell at somebody, you feel better, but they don't. You just passed it there. Don't worry, they'll pass it back in a little while. You guys are going to play hot potato back and forth for an extended period of time if you do that. Digpa. Spreading constriction. Feel the difference? So... No matter what's going on, ngo she chuku ngo jung la. Recognize the Dharmakaya nature of mind as you have recognized before. Actually, although they're using the word recognize twice, I would say notice Dharmakaya nature of mind as you have already recognized. That's Tawa. That's that open awareness that I've been pointing at since yesterday, that glimpse. So as stuff goes on, take a moment, release. You can try the breath thing. It helps if you've got your chi all going. <laughs> Let it go. Notice Tawa. Notice the where, not the what. Notice Dharmakaya nature of mind. Don't hang on to it. Don't try to stabilize it. You're in the middle of a conversation. You're out and about. Something has caused you to feel like scrunching. Probably somebody yelled at you or gave you a hairy eyeball. A dirty look. Insulted you. Said something in another language that they think you don't speak, but you do, and it was insulting. All of these things might make you scrunch. The moment you notice a scrunch coming on, Check and see if your mind is still there. Not little mind, which is what's feeling all scrunchy. Big mind. Semni. Unborn, undying, from beginningless. But you need to know for sure that it's still there. There's an analogy. Suppose I invite you all to go camping with me on an island off the coast of India. And so you're going about town looking for your supplies and who sells peanut butter and all of that good stuff. And some people say, oh, you can't go camping there. It's got tigers. You'll get et. Because it's the right season. It's not the rainy season. We're planning to sleep out. Or at least in just little tiny tents. And other people say, Anna, the tigers are gone. 
they're extinct there. There used to be tigers there like a few hundred years ago, but none have been there for about 100 years. The last one got shot. So don't worry about tigers. But other people say, yeah, they're still there. My brother-in-law's best friend, schoolmate saw. So you're getting tiger stories. And so you come to me, are you sure we're gonna go camp on this island with like just a couple of tents for a few people who are older and everybody else is gonna sleep out? Are you sure this is the right thing? And we went, yeah, there's no tigers here. So we go camp on the island and in the middle of the night you hear a noise. <laughs> and a branch snaps. How you feeling? You a little, it woke you up, you got a little adrenaline going? Think you might be a little worried even though I told you there's no tigers? Now suppose let's try a different scenario. Suppose we went out to the island in the early morning it's not a very big island. And we started searching the island for tiger scat, tiger footprints, any tiger hair, any sign of tigers. And we all, each one of us, covered the entire island, checking, poking under every bush, looking up every tree, even turning over rocks to see if there's maybe a cave behind one. And we didn't find any tigers. By your own experience, you scoured the island for tigers. You're sure you looked in every single place and you didn't find any tigers. And now the same noise happens in the middle of the night. But you know by your own experience from having checked it out with great thoroughness that there's no tigers on the, un on the island. You still wake up from the noise, but you wonder, I want the, what the fuck that was? Monkeys? Somebody got up to go pee and, you know, snort in their sleep, has a stuffy nose. But you're not worried about tigers. This is the analogy, sorry, it's a Tibetan analogy. Tibetans worry about tigers a lot. Of how and why you need to do this practice in at all the time and in all situations, re-recognize or re-cognize, re-open your attention to that which we call tawa, dharmakaya, of natu uh, dharmakaya nature of mind, open awareness, uh, natural mind, semni, and all those many names, uh, kusum. Do you see why? You're checking for tigers. Because otherwise, you're going to be thinking, yes, I know that thoughts aren't real. Except maybe this one, is this one real? The number of people who email me with a series of thoughts saying, yes, I know thoughts aren't real, but would, are these real? No, it's surprisingly common. But I think that. I know thoughts aren't real and yada yada. I understand them talk. I understand the pointing out. But is it true that? Yada, 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 yada. No, those are thoughts too. You won't be sure until you check. A lot. Ngadre Osel Mabuchi. Recognize that same Dharmakaya you recognized before. Tawa. Dharmakaya the infinite openness of infinite open awareness, which is by its nature alive with lucidity, the potential to think, feel, and perceive. Mm -hmm. 
Mahadeo Selma Putri. Let mother and child clear light already acquainted unite. Ah, mother is pointing at the always was and will be. Unborn, undying, innate natural Buddha nature, which is your own true nature. O cell, the clear light nature of mind, you. Not little you, the personality. Big you, the Buddha nature. And child luminosity is Tawa as pointed out by the teacher. In the beginning, they feel far away. There's Tawa, but it seems to come and go. Sometimes you're looking at it, sometimes you're not. And it feels to you as if it's not there when you're not looking at it. Um, above this ceiling, there is a sky. Or is there? You're not looking at it. Was it there when you weren't thinking about it either? Yeah, I like questions better than answers. So when you allow mother luminosity of ground that always was and will be unborn, undying Buddha nature, which is the essence of all life on this planet and others, throughout the three realms of desire, form, and formless, and child luminosity of path, which is the tawa and the method pointed out by the teacher, when they come together, it doesn't say unite them. It says, let them unite. Permit that to occur. You can't shove it. You can't push it. You can allow it. Jack, put, leave, rest. In the aspect of awareness beyond all description. Utterly simple. And there is not a damn thing I can tell you about it except to encourage you to practice until it is utterly simple and obvious to you. Which will happen. You can only keep practicing without hope or fear. You can't actually push the river. It's tiring to push rivers. And it has absolutely no effect on the river, except to tire you out. So don't try too hard. Relax. Look at your mind with your mind. Open. Focus. Mind, mind looking. The seer is the scene and the seeing. Mind itself, but there is no thing to it. Infinite, open, aware, awake, creatively shimmering with phenomena, none of which has substance or duration. When you look at an object. How do you see? The cones in your eyes show color. The rods show shape. So this comes in your retina, where the cones and the rods are. It goes through your tsa to the chakra back here. It's a little chakra in the back of the head, which basically interprets sight. It turns an abstract of light, dark, and multiple colors 
into a known object. You may not know what this is. Look at it without mixes with everything just like it that you've ever seen before in this life and others. That goes on down here. Where that arises feelings around what you named it. Liking and disliking. That's down here and where the um, brain tissue that surrounds your gut, which is super sensitive to neurotransmitters, or your heart chakra, in which all the other tsa cross and come together. And do it in either way, either anatomy, same thing. Point I'm doing is you don't see the thing. You see what you think you see. A little round ball in a hat. What is it? Do you know? Everything you see, all your perceptions. Perception is a word that is a combination of sensations, color and shape, and interpretation, thoughts on those sensations. Naming, back here it starts with. So when I say your perceptions, what I refer to is a clump of physical sensations and mental sensations around that being naming thoughts, conversation with yourself, and then the feelings about that. So perceptions are really not separate from thoughts and feelings. They're inside, not outside. They're your perceptions. When you take certain uh, power plants, you will notice that you see things that you do not see when you haven't taken those power plants. Yeah, patterns that weren't there. The sugar bowl didn't have those amazing colors and patterns in it before you took the acid. Does now, though. There weren't all those amazing creatures with eyes hanging out in the trees before you took the mushroom. Are now. Right? So you know that what you see is what you think you see. And your feelings about what you see are not about what you see, but about what you think you see and the story you tell yourself about it. You want a story that illustrates this? So one time in India, I'm sort of stoned, but not very. I go, get a, go out from the party, the group of friends that were hanging together, and go to take a leak, which where we were, that's you just go out somewhere and do that. So I undo my pants, and I squat, and I look up, and there's two glowing eyeballs here. But, I mean, I don't have depth perception. It's dark of the moon. I can barely see anything. But I see them over there, and it's like, what could that be? Bat? Cat? You know, it doesn't look very big. And I look away, you know, probably looking for a wiping leaf. A soft kind of fuzzy leaf that you use for that. And I look back, and they're this far apart. I think, oh, it was farther away than I thought, and it's bigger than I thought, and now it's nearer than I think. <laughs> what the fuck is that, bear? There were bears in that forest. It's getting too big to be a simple leopard. Fuck, so I'm, now I'm looking away, I'm reaching around for a stick or some kind of weapon. You know, and I stand up. As I stand up, I look back, and that far away. I'm like, oh, fuck, monster. <laughs> Nothing is that big, and it's got to be really close. So holding my pants with one hand and some stupid old twig with the other, I start walking towards it. 
Because, I mean, if there's a monster after you, what do you do? You walk towards it. Running wouldn't help if it was that big. So I start walking towards it until I see what it is. There's a flat branch here. And there's a pair of glowworms walking in opposite directions on it. So there you have all that set of emotions I felt. about nothing that was really there. But telling yourself it's not real doesn't work. Why? You're taking a thought, the thought says it's not real, and you're trying to cover up another thought that says it is, and you end up with this pancake stack of thoughts, which just makes it more complex and doesn't do diddly squat. So leave that alone. Don't think at it. All your thoughts, feelings, and perceptions are going on inside of you. That doesn't mean that that house over there is inside of you. But everything you think and feel, and all the naming house of that, pattern of grays and blacks and whites seen mostly with your rods. Anything beyond a simple pattern of light and dark, because that doesn't have color, is inside you. See that? It's not out there. What you think it is, I think it's a house. That's me. I have no idea what the bug crawling on it thinks it is. A great hot plane. The spider spinning a web on it might think it's a weird kind of tree, if it thinks even that far. It's the naming you do, and the story about the naming, and the feelings about the story. So. If there were a very big tree, one of those giant live oaks, and you, for reasons of your own, wanted to get all the leaves off it. So you got us some good ladders, and you started picking them off one by one. Started on the left. By the time you got to the right, they'd be growing back on the left. You'd never get all the leaves off the tree. How do you get it off? A little strip of bark around the base. And all the leaves turn brown and fall off. This is not to say you would want to do that to a tree. This is an analogy. You have to cut the root. You can't pick all your hang-ups off one by one. They're infinite. And you'll just make more tomorrow. Cut the root. The root is you believe your thoughts, you believe the story you're telling yourself, and it bothers you. Next weekend, why does samsara hurt? A much bigger explanation on this topic. Why does samsara bother you? Why on earth would you want to get out when it's got such good music? The root is gone. To again and again, in gentle situations while sitting on your cushion in the early morning with the birds singing, until it's easy, and then in traffic, out in the middle of some festival, at the pub, up the gain. Take it to where you personally are challenged. You're not all challenged in the same place. Some of you are quite comfortable at the festival. But where do you keep your lawyers around here? Is there a part of town that you keep them in, where everybody wears suits and goes to offices? Hmm? DCBD. DCB? CBDE. C oh, CBDE. OK. So. For you, go on down to CBDE and try to fit in. See, that would be your challenge. 
whereas someone else's challenge might be going to a rave. You wouldn't mind. But you start at the easy end. Start on your cushion, controlled environment. Look at your mind with your mind again and 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 again until you can do that shift. And yes, it's a doing. We're not trying to get past the doing yet. I'll unravel that for you later. Go ahead and do the doing now. Unpoint focus your attention. Those of you who are writing down the instructions, this is your basic instruction. Unpoint focus your attention so that it is not picking across in a linear time from thought to thought to thought to thought to thought to thought to thought with the feelings riding those thoughts, depending on whether they're, ha they're thoughts that you like the story of and it makes you happy, or thoughts that you don't like the story of and it makes you sad. Practice on your cushion. And when that has become easy, start practicing everywhere else. In the beginning, take a walk. Realize anything that is not inherently stable, so give up the idea of stabilizing your Dzogchen awareness. Don't worry, I'll teach you how to find the inherently stable Dzogchen awareness that you've already got, but isn't the one you're looking at because you're still not quite you're still just hitting the edge of the target with the dart. It's still spinning. There's a kind of dart game where you hang the target. And so if you don't hit it right on, if you don't hit the bullseye right on, the target spins. Then you have to get your next one on it while it's spinning. Stillness and bliss, clarity and thinking. Pop them again and again. Pet. But be looking there. Nyams will happen. They will be a signpost that you are getting somewhere, that you are practicing properly. It doesn't matter what the nyam is. It doesn't matter if the blue light came from below or above, nor does it matter what it did with the red light. That's a story that you have placed on an experience to simplify it, to be able to talk about it. What matters is that you're having a nyam. Your nyam might be color lights mucking about with each other. That's been known to happen. Don't dwell on the nyam. Don't grab the nyam. Don't cherish the nyam. Don't think this is it. Don't yell at it and tell it this is not it go away either. Either wait till it passes, and if it doesn't in a reasonable amount of time, some yams are just going blip, 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 blip. and there's no reason you got to do anything to them. They're not even there long enough. But if it gets stuck, and they do, then you hit it with pet. Tabshi yigi lobor bet. Suddenly strike with the syllable of skillful means and wisdom. Pa in pet. Pa. This particular letter is skillful means. Rig pa. See er. It's the same letter in the suffix that means doer of. Bodhisattva, skillful means. 
tra. Kultra. Wisdom. Tra, stillness. It's the same letter that begins the word for stillness. Trul tra is moving stillness. Trul tra. So when you put these two together, you get the magic word. Anybody do Kabbalah studies around here? This is quite similar, where each of the letters in the Hebrew alphabet has this special meaning. And it all relates to the tree of life. Anyway, Tibetan has a similar thing going that came out of Sanskrit. So, pe is pa tra. As such, it is means and wisdom together. Means is the young. Oh, uh, dorji is a slang word for your penis. One time, not me, I use the pet and word te penis, but some other nice young person was trying to teach safe sex and contraceptive to the Tibetans, so they, and, but they're very polite and trained in dharamsala. So they're all, well, you put the condom on the uh, dorji. The number of people who put the condom on the dorji and left it on the altar and thought that would prevent <laughs> pregnancy was alarming. <laughs> young. Now you're going to remember which one's the young, aren't you, with that story? Yin, emptiness, bodhisattva, trul, movement, pa, mover, tra, wisdom, openness. as one thing. We got any Yab Yum Tonkas in here? All those images of Tibetan archetypes in sexual congress, like Vajrasattva in many of the images, that's all it symbolizes. It doesn't symbolize an orgasm, but rather the great bliss like an orgasm, blissful like an orgasm only not a sudden pshu, but a steady always. The great bliss that arises from the union of wisdom and method. That is the vitality, the life force of the universe. That is the true bodhisattva whose nature is bliss. It's in the Chenrezig Sadhana, if any of you do it at the end when it's all light and it's all. Yeah, you get so you can arise that as you will. Don't try to keep it. It's a nyam, a meditative experience. You know how to recognize a nyam? It had a beginning. Something caused it. In uh, Zen Buddhism, they're called comes and goes, nyams. Their word is literally comes and goes in Japanese. I've at the moment forgotten the word. I have it written somewhere. So you can know you're having a nyam if it started at a point in time and was caused by an action or non-act, or not an action, or refraining from acting. Impermanence. Anything that begins will end. A ray is a mathematical concept. They do not exist actually in reality. Not in time. Even in space, the light of a star, a star ray, will in enough distance be thinned out enough to be immeasurable by anything. Also, there's the time element in enough time. 
Nyam shek jitob. Tade me make no difference between on the cushion and off the cushion. Tudang tutsumi yewa me no division between session and break time. You don't meditate when you're sitting there and then intentionally stop when you get up. One thing you're going to worry about, everybody worries about this, how the hell am I going to get everything done if I don't think? If I don't pay attention to my thoughts, how will I accomplish anything? You know, there's a schedule, it's all written down, it's made of thoughts. It will occur and you will slide smoothly in it. And thinking does not have to disturb Dharmakaya awareness, nor does Dharmakaya awareness need to disturb thinking. How the heck do you think I'm able to give you words while transmitting and pointing? They don't bother each other. They never did. Do you understand any of that? That the thoughts won't bother the meditation and the meditation won't bother the thoughts? This will happen to you. You can't make it happen. All you can do is follow the instructions of Gom. Yerme Nangdo Gundune. Always remain in this individual sta indivisible state. You always are. It's not a state that you go in and out of. On Kyang Tinpa Matopa. But until stability occurs, Dudze Pangne Gompachi. It is vital to meditate away from distractions and busyness. What this means is you really want to set aside some good time on the cushion without anybody nattering at you. Uh, turn off the sound on your phone. Otherwise, you're going to want to see what just weebled. Give yourself that time in the morning. Give yourself that time in the evening. If you have the ability in your lifestyle, us retired folks, give your that, yourself that time in the middle of the day, or those of you on your own schedule who can give yourself a lunch hour. Take the time, but don't sit for too long at first. I'm going to go away from the text a little bit and clarify the how-to here. For me, it works best before I speak, read, or interact with language that I sit up, go on and check email, say good morning, Frequently during the day, she asks me if I'm watching psychic cartoons often. And no, I'm, I'm just this. Feel it, catch it. There's no words. This is what I mean by mind, mind looking but it's not an act of doing. It doesn't bother the thoughts. You don't have to talk talking to do it. Just that. Do it often. Depending on what you do at work, Either tell your computer to remind you every 20 minutes to stretch your neck, 
There's programs that do this just for your physical health. Find some way to pattern it into your day. This is in the beginning. Three minutes. Um, different, if you're drinking enough water, you will probably take a leak about six times a day. If you're not drinking enough water, you won't do that. Yeah, five or six. So guess what? Five or six times a day, you get to sit down with your channels in alignment for a minute. Guys, you can sit. It won't kill you. Take the time, use the stall. I mean, unless you have to use a tree, but that's a different matter. Just a minute or two. You have just refreshed your view of Tawa. Your Tawa. Now, in between that, right in the middle of conversations, gentle, easy conversations in the first six months or year that you're doing this, progressing to more intense conversations. I'm still not letting you do this while you drive or operate a chainsaw, okay? Not while operating heavy machinery yet. That's an advanced practice. Because you unfocus your eyes. You can't do this in traffic. You'll lose awareness. Somebody's cut, cut in front of you, you're not going to see them. Same with chainsaws. They jump. You're going to hit a knot, and that's the end of your leg. So not while operating heavy machinery. Caution. A car is a heavy machine, so is your motorcycle. But at other times, such as while playing music, while walking down the street, while talking to a friend, check and see if it's still there. That's GOM, repeated checking. My teacher's teacher, my teacher's root teacher, who was not his heart teacher, but was the root teacher of his heart teacher, and also the root teacher of Norbu Rinpoche, if any of you have studied with him or heard of him. The way he put it, while walking and talking, while getting up and sitting down, reaffirm to yourself the already known Dharmakaya nature of mind. And he does not mean think it, he means check on it. While, while you are doing things, right while you do them, right in the middle of taking a step in that dynamic balance, on the dance floor, really good. While you paint, see what happens. This is GOM. This is how you do it. And you follow these instructions until such time as the certainty arises by its own accord. No river pushing, grasping at it. Questions on the how-to of GOM, the second word of Garib Dorji. From uh, out there either? Uh, also make sure your microphone's close in. Appears to be right where I put it. Yeah, this one's a bit more sensitive. But on to the question. Um, there's questions from one of our Spanish viewers about mm -hmm. how to distinguish this, a genuine experience of Tawa from an experience constructed, say, in the mind, the experience we want to have of Tawa? If it is a nyam, it has a beginning. If you get it during meditation, it's a nyam, a meditative experience. Pop it. 
If it comes, it will go. Remember the term comes and goes. All nyams have a cause, your practice, because they're meditative experiences. They have a beginning in time when they start, and by perforce they will have an end in time when they wear off. Now, it is easy to get a nyam that seems really close to what all the texts have told you, is the non-meditation. And so you think, got it. And you stop creating the cause for it by doing your sitting practice because there is no difference for you between on the cushion and off the cushion. Oops. Took about 10 months to wear off. And then I'm to my bitch, go, team llama. And llama's like, <laughs> practice. So if it came, it gonna go. There is no stability of meditation you can achieve, acquire, create, or find. Let mother and child luminosity unite. Child luminosity of path, this is your practice. Mother luminosity of ground, this is the always was and will be, the true Buddha nature of all life. By continuing your practice, they will come together of their own accord, and yet can they make them? You can only keep practicing without hope and fear. Another question? Sure. Um, actually, are there any questions? Yes. Yes, there is one. Okay. So, uh, how, how do we recognize this feeling? Tawa? Tawa? If there is no beginning and ending, like how we can go, like, it's not a, like the awareness of that. Remember, all I want you to do at the moment is get your dart somewhere on the dartboard. I don't expect you to hit the bullseye yet. So, although what you are seeing is the moon reflected in a puddle, rather than the moon in the sky, it's still the moon. Going in the right direction, keep going. Keep checking on that tawa, let it mature. The more you check on it, the more it deepens into its own natural state, which becomes, is seen as, is recognized as non-separate from mother luminosity of ground at some point. You can't make it do that. What you are seeing as Tawa is not the end-all, be-all, it's path. It's child luminosity of path, and that's okay. Because we all be still sentient beings. When you really see it right on absolutely center point, you will notice your light body, your rainbow body. Rainbow body is not something that you achieve through certain practices. Your channel body is made of light and rainbows. Always was. You just don't see it that way. You see meat. That, at some point, when you cease to rely on your interpretation of perceptions according to your thoughts and your emotions riding them, when that totality of mis- Perceiving, misseeing, misexplaining, misstorytelling has completed itself when the display has completed itself. 
rainbow body is obvious. Always was there, always will be. The same as Tawa. Did this in some way answer your question? You don't have to be perfect yet. Get in the ballpark and it's fine. You're practicing. A Tawa that's good enough for practice is simply an experience, a nyam, of infinite open awareness. That experience, which you have had sometimes. You get that experience to happen more and more, and it gets deeper and deeper, and sometimes you break it because it does come and go. It's a nyam. And just for an instant perceivable to you, right behind it is the real one, but you can't keep that because you're not ready yet. So you use the nyam one again and again, allowing it to deepen and come closer until eventually, inevitably, child luminosity of path and mother luminosity of ground are recognized as the same thing. That happens. Will happen. Will have happened, depending on what tense I'm talking to you from. Tense is variable here. Time is not what you think it is. Nyam jak tundu chela dya. Dividing the practice into proper meditation sessions. This is what I was talking about, a longer morning one. 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Some quickie day ones. Four or five, six times. Minute and a half, maybe two minutes. Nobody's going to notice. A nice evening one, uh, when you're ready for bed. This is in the middle of an active work life. If you are in retreat and can, you make one session before the sun comes up. One session after the sun comes up. This far south, we don't worry about it. Uh, it's different. Up in the north countries, you have to adjust this for season. And then you make a really good lunch. You eat a really good lunch. Here, these sessions are longer, or they're pairs of sessions with a cup of tea in between. If you can only do 20 minutes, then it's 20 minutes, cup of tea, 20 minutes to take up about an hour, or maybe even an hour and a half. And then it's time to cook lunch. Lunch is your main meal. Really nice lunch. Make sure your lunch has enough oil in it. This is not the time to be on a really intense uh, diet. You'll get lung in a retreat. Lunch, nap. Take a walk, do your laundry, have a bath. When the light turns golden, you know what I'm talking about? Then's your next session. You stop and have a soup made out of lunch's leftovers at sunset while you watch the sunset. And then you have another session or you're making double sessions after sunset. That's retreat pattern for this close to the equator where there's not that much difference. Completely different up in Norway. Then it's seasonal changes. But even if you're out in busy life, you're in school, at work, raising a family, you still make the sessions. They're just adjusted differently. That's important. If you don't do that, your ability to find Tawa will wear off. It takes about after a teaching where you actually got the pointing out. If you don't do the practice within 24 hours by yourself, your ability to find it begins to diminish. I shout about it a lot, telepathically. That's why I send you home after each one of these saying, go find it on your own, go find it on your own. Because you need to do that at least once every 24 hours to maintain continuity 
of the practice. That might be 30 seconds, but that's your minimal. No, no dom sig, you don't create digpa if you choose not to do that. If you decide this practice is not for you, that's fine. But should you wish to do this practice, maintain it in that way. Make sense? Kapish? Yiddish. Or at least New Yorker. Do dang nikatamche do at all times and in any situation. Chuku chikpo yolang chang abide by the flow of what is just dharmakaya. Delijin me kotakche. Decide with absolute conviction that there is nothing other than this by repeating it again and again. Tachik tok tu chipeti ni pa ni pao. This is the second vital point, deciding on one thing and one thing only. If you're going to practice Sogchen, if you choose, and not necessarily everyone here is going to choose that, some of you won't like it, you decide to practice it. That doesn't mean you can't practice a yidam. You practice a yidam for the sake of your zogchen, because it synergizes. You go on a drum journey for the sake of your zogchen because you hope it will synergize. Whatever practice you do, you do in the context of zogchen, regardless of which lineage. That's to decide on a single thing. You're going to go for it. This is the last teaching, the one life teaching. Doesn't matter how much longer you got in a life, you can still do it. You see, Tantra, well, Sutrayana takes, I think I say, at a minimum four lives to a to recognize enlightenment. Tantrayana takes one life to recognize enlightenment. Dzogchen is instantaneous. But which instant, I'm not telling. <laughs> All the time in any situation Abide by the flow. It is all just dharmakaya. <sighs> flow is a very special word. Yolang. Flow. within the time-space continuum. There is a flow of movement. That flow does not have individual pieces flowing. It has intersections, karmic intersections. You're a clump of causes and effects. You have been conditioned. Your personality, the clump that you think is your personality, by every author you've ever read, every film you've ever seen, every person you've ever kissed, every cat or dog you've ever petted, every shopkeeper you've ever purchased from, every farmer who has grown your food. You're an intersection of all these beings, causes, and influences. 
You all are more than 14 years old. You all remember the personality you had at 14? So you're not that person anymore, are you? What changed you? Experiences. They were interactive. Unless you fell a long distance, your interactions with rocks probably didn't change you as much. Although there may be exceptions to that. Mostly, it was interactions with other beings. You will change again by tomorrow and by the day after that. You're a constantly sliding point of intersection between many lines, and so is everybody else. And we're going into each other and coming out of each other, and we're exchanging our biome here. And your biome also tells you what to do, and you're inhaling mine, and I'm inhaling yours. And you're not as friggin' separate as you think you are, since there is no individual, there can be no individual enlightenment. In the moment of enlightenment, all sentient beings arise as all Buddhas. And this is why I do guru yoga for bodhisattva and refuge, the same thing. Since all beings arise as all Buddhas, your Guru Yoga is your Bodhisattva. How can you not love them the way you love your teacher? With the gratitude toward the teacher as shown the pointing out, all Buddhas will have done so for some entity of which you are constructed since you're a moving, slipping, sliding nexus. So they're all your root guru, all Buddhas. Of the three times, all sentient beings of the three realms, it comes to the same thing. Decide to practice is the key. All the time in any situation, allow the flow of what is inherently dharmakaya itself to continue. You do that by repeated glancing. <coughs> when you've glanced often enough, you will see what is meant by the dharmakaya flow continues as phenomena because they're not separate. Frequent enough glancing will clarify that point. And I don't think I have other words that will clarify it for you before then. And that is the completion of the teaching on Gam. This is a how-to. Finding Tawa is just me shouting at you, Tawa. Hey, look over there, look over there. Gam is where I give you the specific instructions of how to mature your practice into its natural state. So I want to make sure that all of you out there and all of you in here before we close today know how to proceed if you wish to proceed. You don't have to ask me how to proceed or your questions if you've chosen not to proceed with this. Any questions on the how-to? Yes. Um, did, did you talk about the role of, if any, of like community in our reflection? Remember that the people around you are changing you. And you're changing them. In Tantra, it is advised that you spend not more than three days living in the house of a monotheist or someone who is anti-tantric, even among the multi-theists. This is because they'll pull you out of it just by being who they are. So, you know, if your mom's very religious in some other way, you spend three days, you take a day off. 
you spend three days, you take a day off. It doesn't say abandon your mother. You have gratitude to your mother even if she's crazy. All mothers are crazy. Being mothers makes you crazy. All people are crazy, all sentient beings are crazy, and sentient beings are what mothers are made of, so you really can't blame them for being nuts. You love them anyway. But three days for someone who disapproves of your type of practice. And this includes those galupas who are suri, who disapprove of Zogchen. You don't live with them for more than three days because they're going to get in. And you're going to get in them, and you're going to make your, each other so uncomfortable in your practices. Conversely, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. Sangha is your community. It's the outer refuge. For the same reason we create covens when we're trying to cast spells. We bring people together for group practices. And we tend to encourage, but not like with a tightness, people to hang out with other Sangha members. After all of my teaching groups, we have a virtual coffee pot, which I pass to somebody. And they stay online holding the meeting open after I leave so that Sangha can talk to and get to know each other. Because since people are all over the world, and some are in countries I can't get into, and some are unable to get out of their countries. You know, we got some pirated signals going on from some weird places. It's pretty much the only Sangha they can get, some. Others can have a sangha like here, where you can actually hang out and go to the pub together. You can actually hang out and go to the pub with me at times when I'm here. You just got to invite me. But I do do that. It's very important to develop not only your own family, your, you have your birth family, but to also have a chosen family that shares some of your interests. At least it should not disparage Zogchen. They don't all have to be Zogchen practitioners, although it's nice if a few are. But they should not dislike it. And you will find some Dharma practitioners in Sutrayana and in Golupa who seriously dislike Zogchen. Well, one or two of those in your life won't hurt you, but don't live with them. Check out your roommates. Adjust where necessary. Does that answer your question? You see, we're all poking into each other and changing each other all the time. So you want to kind of predominantly let your people who are influencing you be people you approve of. People who are trying to go in the direction you hope to go in so that maybe they'll pull you along with them, or when they're having a bad day, you'll pull them along with you. That's not the passive aggressiveness of letting them behave however they want when they're having a bad day. That's not refusing to set limits. That's simply you do, you watch your practice, and maybe with luck, with in the limits you are setting, you can pull them along into a better state of mind when they're having a bad day. And maybe you can't. Well, do not take this as, don't take bodhisattva as the fake bodhisattva where it's like, I'm supposed to be super good. I, uh, really, don't do that. Set limits where you need to. Put on your oxygen mask first before you mess with the one for your partner, friend, child, or whatever. Like they say in the airplanes. Important. Other questions? Yep. 
you can do this whenever you are stuck. Um, are you any kind of physical body worker? This is super good for anyone who is. If you're touching people with your hands, if you're massaging them, if you're diagnosing them. Imagine yourself like a, one of those funny fiber optic lamps where the light's in the middle and there's all these lit up strings coming out of it, except they're all coiled around and turned inward. You have chakras which look like, remember chakras are described as wheels, except they're three-dimensional wheels. So they don't actually look like wheels, they look like this. They go around this way and this way. So I carry a slinky so I can show you that. There's all sorts of tools in here for demonstrating things. So what you're gonna do as you breathe in, you're going to inflate your chakras and your channels. So they come out of every chakra. The main chakras are this one, this one, and this one. But you also have a secret chakra uh, where your cervix is in there. And you have chakras in the soles of your feet and the palms of your hands. Those are secondary. And then you have lots of little ones in your elbows and back here and over here. So what you're going to do is you're going to inflate them. But not so hard they squeak. You really don't want your channels to squeak. It hurts. I talked to someone today who I noticed was having squeaky channels, and I called them to have a conversation with me. Squeaky channels are pretty noticeable. So they inflate, they extend out just like this, unravel, untorque. So stretch your body while you do this. What you're doing as you stretch your body is you're inflating and uncoiling all your channels out to infinity, past the Earth's orbit around the sun, past the galaxies, past uh, the outer ocean and the fence around it, however you perceive the universe, far, far, far as you can imagine, and then a little bit more. And you're also stretching them in time as far into the past and future as you can imagine. And you're stretching them across the dream time into all the dreams of all the sentient beings of the universe. You're stretching in every dimension you can imagine. All in the in-breath. Don't close your glottis at the top of the in-breath. Hold the air in with your diaphragm and your chest muscles. And just relax as you blow out. Don't try to coil them up, just relax. When you do one of those, you return to your natural state. And if you have just had an interaction with someone who has left you a bit shaken, do that. They'll just think you're having a stretch after you leave them. Get their residue off you before it comes in. If you have, you know how it is when you're doing medicine, massage, uh, acupuncture, any kind of di medicine. If three people have tummy aches in a row that night, you're going to have a tummy ache if you're not careful. This is what you do in between patients to get it off you so you don't carry their illnesses in your pattern. Because when you take a pulse and diagnose, you're matching your pattern to theirs to see what it feels like inside. 
At least you are with Tibetan and Chinese diagnosis. You're also smelling them. You're getting right into their biome, right up close. You're feeling them. You want to get that off you because they've come to you because they're sick. You don't want to be taking those on. So this is in between patients. I was taught it in Chinese medicine and then also in Tibetan for if you've just had a light trauma. The bus driver yelled at you and left you shaken because you don't like that. It doesn't have to be a major trauma. I'm not sure it'll get out a major trauma if it's really gone in. Maybe. I haven't tried it on one. But it'll get out the little stuff, the annoying stuff, the stuff that left you, which a lot of life does. Yes? Is there a format for practicing Dogchen in between groups? Arise, Bodhisattva, and take refuge by whichever method you as a Sangha chooses. So whoever's going to be doing that, you decide on how that's going to be done. Usually there's a little chanting involved. It might be what I do with Guru Yoga. It might be something else that everybody likes. The refuge prayer, when you take it to its extent, is beautiful. Sanje Chuge Dun Le Chap Wo. I take refuge in Buddha Dharma Sangha. Lama Yidam Khandro La Chapsuchiwo. I take refuge in the teacher, the archetype, and the Dakinis, Daka Dakinis. Tsa Lung Tigli La Chapsuchiwo. I take refuge in the infinitude of the channels, the chi that rides within them, and the innate life force creativity of that. I don't know how to translate Tigli. Chuku longku truku la chapsu chiwo. I take refuge in the Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, Nirmanakaya. Rang sem tong sang o la chapsu chiwo. My own mind's emptiness, transparency, clarity, the nature of that, I take refuge. Isn't that a nice little prayer? I like that one for taking refuge. And then you just need to add in maybe some chin raising, some manis, with an unfolding lotus. That's what I like, if I were going to do them separately. So you all, whoever's going to get together and practice Sogchen together, you decide how you want to do those two parts. You decide how you want to dedicate merits. In between, you sit there quietly. An amount of time has been agreed upon by the participants, and somebody does that when the timer's over. I much prefer that to a buzz or a cell phone dingle. So I'd be more likely, if I was the leader of the session, to have my cell phone on vibrate in the pocket and do that when that happened. Does that answer your question? Other questions from out there? Uh, yes, one question, well, there's a number of questions, but one of the questions is, is there a tip to ease the feeling of boredom while practicing, or does one just push through it? If, okay, there's two answers. I want you to try both who's asking that or who's feeling that, whether you asked it or not, and see which one works for you. Shorter sessions. Keep your session no more than 10% longer than is an ease. If you can rest in nature of mind for 30 seconds, 50 seconds, 40 seconds is about right for a session. Just make multiples of them. If you can rest mostly pretty well for about half an hour, give it 40 minutes. 
on your timer. The reason you go just a little longer than you can before boredom sets in, before you're getting antsy and wanting to get up, is to stretch it without wasting it. You don't want to go stale. So better you make a dozen short sessions with a gap of entertainment in between. Say you're doing one minute, two minutes reading email or scrolling on your cell phone. And then relax a bit, try another minute of meditation, and then take some entertainment. That you shouldn't have to do that for too long. It gets easier and less boring. If that doesn't work, this may not be the suitable practice for you at this time. Do some Tantra for a while. Consider a Nundro. Some boredom is normal. Overwhelming boredom is a sign that it may not be the right practice for you if that doesn't pass within a couple of months. Doesn't lighten up to be some boredom rather than overwhelming boredom. You see how I'm telling you to balance this? Hopefully that was an answer that the person who asked the question needed. Uh, next question. How do we reconcile these instructions with the practice of Tong Lin? There's a couple of questions about how to integrate this practice, say, with a Yidam practice or Tong Lin. Or you do other them things. at different times. Tong Lin is a practice with many results and often some side effects if done improperly. It's a delicate practice. You have to do it right. And there's different ways of doing it, but there's certain things to keep aware of. When you are doing Tong Len, be doing Tong Len. Don't mix glancing at the view with your Tong Len until you are extremely skilled at both. They don't mix. When they mix naturally without you intending to do so, it's less of a problem. But don't try to mix them. With Yidam practice, this practice comes in after it has been reabsorbed. You know where everything becomes the Yidam and the Yidam becomes the seed syllable in the heart and the seed syllable in the heart vanishes into itself? And then you sit in awareness of no thing in Tawa until that wears off, until you can't do that anymore. You'll usually get more time doing it that way than just sitting in Tawa without the preface of a Yidam Sadhana. Why? Your thinker be tired now. You've just visualized something very intense and very specific with lights going every which way in very specific and intense manners. Now you can rest. And it's much easier to rest when you're tired. So it synergizes nicely with Yidam, done at the proper time. Don't try to keep glancing during your Yidam practice. Yinna. During your Yidam practice, you're really focused on the thoughts. A lot of point focus on what's in the hands, in what it's doing, what it's trampling on, what your Yidam's wearing what your yidam's holding, how many arms, the colors of the different things. So you've got a lot of things to point focus on. 
And then at the very end, after the full absorption, but before you reinstate yourself as the yidam at the end of the session, in that gap there, you rest in Tawa. Eventually, the time, the length of time you rest in Tawa should be about as long as it took you to do the entire Yidam practice. They should equalize. This is after many years of practicing both. Okay? Not today or tomorrow. Other questions here? I'll try to show it again. I want you to glance with me. Let's say we're here having a conversation. Do you see that? Can you do that? Try using the symbolic mnemonic of unfocusing your eyes. while looking at me, let it go of your point focus. Things look a little blurry in the middle and a little clearer on the edge. Use that whenever you want to shift your attention to where you're thinking the words you're saying. Words are expressed thoughts, so while we're having a conversation in the middle of talking, did you see that slight change? That was me glancing strongly at Tawa and then back into the words I'm talking to you with. Now, yes, I overemphasized that. I did that with more intensity than I usually you wouldn't catch me at it. But I wanted you to see how it's done. Now you try it with me. Whatever, tell me about uh, what you had for lunch. Glance. Talk. And did you have a coffee or a lime? Coffee What a lovely lunch. Did you enjoy it? Glance. While laughing, glance. You see how we do that? Now, it gets easier if you spend a little time on the cushion in the morning, and then you do these little sessions during the day. You can do them in the loo. You look perhaps old enough to retire. I don't know. I'm not retired, so what the heck. There is no real age for it. But if you have the free time, <laughs> a chair, a bench, let's say you're walking down to the wherever. You're walking the dog and you see a convenient bench, wall, stone, object, or I need to show you the standing position. If you don't know martial arts, it's the horse stance. You know the horse stance? Come demonstrate a not very deep horse stance. Because you're not wearing a skirt and they won't be able to see how my legs are. Yeah, feet are parallel right below the shoulders. No, you don't want to go that deep. Right between, just below the shoulders. Yeah, your butt's in now, no fists, just go round. Yeah, now relax it more. Pull your chin back a little bit for a double chin. Back straight, you're pulling your ass in just a little bit too much. There you go. There. <laughs> A little bit more natural. You're doing it more like you're, it's, you're going to do it in a fight, and we're doing it more like just standing, waiting. And you don't have to go that deep. Just don't lock them. There you go. So a really light horse stance is standing meditation. Find a patch of shade under a tree. Stand in that position. That's aligning your channels. Thank you. and glance. 
especially if your dog has found something interesting to sniff, he doesn't mind to stop. <laughs> Got to read his pee mail. <laughs> Did that feel like an answer that you can work with? Other questions out there? We may have covered this yesterday, but one question is the text you were reading from. And I, didn't we give a link to it yesterday? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to. Yeah, you want to do those again? Yeah, this is the title, The Special Teaching of the Wise and Glorious King. Uh, um, um, let me see how they phrased it on here. It's, I know it is the three words of Garib Dorji. Right, it's the three. Okay, Special Teaching of the Wise and Glorious King. Now, it, when you get it from Losawa House, it says it's by Patro Rinpoche. Right. However, I don't think so. I think that might be a typo. I have been told by my teacher that this is actually by Garib Dorji. And the commentary of which there is here, ah, which he you are welcome to read, is by Patrol Rinpoche. Mm. He didn't write the root text and the commentary. So I think they got a typo here. Yeah, the root text is in there. I'll... This is, I've been working mostly from the root text. Because the thing with doing the commentary is there's a lot of these um, very Tibetan analogies. And to open those up and have them make sense to a Westerner who has a different linguistic base would take a lot of time. Mm. And actually could, unless they've had this a few times, if it was the first time they had it, distract from the pith. Uh, maybe sometime when they, everybody has had it before and we're just doing it again, I'll do that text. Because Rinpoche has taught it to me, that text. And it's really quite nice. But it can be distracting from the pith for someone who hasn't had it before. And this is the pith. Find Tawa. The first night I taught you a method of finding it, if you can't, by looking through the body to see where your thoughts be happening. Having found Tawa, rest with it. Don't grab it, don't try to maintain it, don't try to shove it away and look away from it. Just relax in the view until a thought distracts you and you follow it off and then you notice you did this and come back and relax in the view. If you can't find the view, follow your thoughts home. Look inside your body and outside of your body. Try to find your thoughts. Once you've found Tawa, find it often until it's super easy to find and take it off the cushion. Don't really try doing it all walking around and doing it while you're walking the dog until it's gotten kind of easy on the cushion. If this is new to you, give yourself a few weeks, a few months, whatever. Once it's easy to find on the cushion with all the circumstances perfect, then we start in here, gom, the second part. That's where you at all times and in all circumstances, whatever you're doing while you're doing it, check and see if Tawa is still there, if it went anywhere, if it disappeared from you while you weren't looking. Become certain by your own experience. Check for tigers, yourself. That's the practice of Gom. If while you're on your cushion, you get stuck in a meditative experience, pop it with pet. Not usually necessary while walking around, just moving your body is going to pop a anyam. The spontaneous action of non-action is tomorrow morning. That's what all this leads up to. 
There isn't a to do about it there. So this is your last easy part that involves you doing something. So go do it tonight. Because <laughs> tomorrow there's nothing to be done. But I'll teach it to you anyway. Questions out there? On the how-to or just any on the today's teaching? On today's teaching. Uh, going back to the subject of nyams, um, is there any significance to a nyam that's experienced intensely by more than one person at the same time? No. Shared karma. Telepathic link. You're not as separate as you think you are. Everybody's oozing into you. <laughs> Don't get upset about it. That they're oozing in. There's no need to block them. You're oozing into them. Let go. Pine tree thistle down sunbeam. When the storm comes, the powerful, strong pine tree creaks and groans. When the storm is too much, it falls over. When the storm comes, the thistle down is uninjured, but blown hither and thither, thither, who knows where it will land. When the winds get strong, and the sunbeam, no problem. Other questions? Yes. Like how can we apply or integrate this teaching in daily life? Like, for example, this morning we were talking about um, sugar cravings when we have this overflow and we're like craving for sugar. Like, is there any integration? Or like Not in trying to improve your life. Okay. That's a trap. Sticky wicket. Uh, that's a British term. Um, I, what do you say? You're Spanish speaking? Yeah. Or Portuguese? Spanish speaking. What do you say in Spanish for something that the British would call a sticky wicket? Um, something that would trap you easily? A fly trap? Yeah. Yeah, so that's what that is if you try to imp use it to improve your life. Because that's using it to grasp at your hopes and shove away your fears. And it doesn't, that's, that actually goes in the opposite direction from it, away from Tawa. Trying to improve things every day in every way. I'm getting better and better, yetter and yetter, wetter and wetter. However you want to do it, you don't want to go there. So, instead, by simply repeatedly glancing at Tawa, while everything happens around you, while you do your daily doings, without any hope of getting something out of that, like less sugar cravings, or an improvement in your something or other, but just for the doing of it. You may get a side effect of improvement, but it's a nyam. Don't count on it. And don't grab. Uh, questions there? Uh, there's a question, can you talk a bit about the concept of one taste in relation to this? That's tomorrow. Okay. Anything else on there? Um, not that... Okay, anything else out here? No. Sounds 
since we're all in this together, may all beings be free of the assorted hang-ups that trap them in samsara, free of hope and fear, able to dance freely in the flow as the flow tomorrow the flow <laughs>
a lot of the Kenori nuns. These ones we get an extra sponsor for. So it's not just one. So rather than tell you, you have to find more, I'd rather share it around because it's not like a piece of pie. You know, pie, you take half the pie away, you got half a pie left. Gewa doesn't work like that. And what's being shared is Gewa. Opening. Questions on that? Actually, if you all got questions on that, send me an email and I'll tell you more about it. Or I'll have a friend tell you more about it if I'm not going to have time at that point. We do have yogis available. Yes? I have a public service note. Yes, please. Now is the time. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and we changed the name. It's becoming the um, Tenzin Pulchong Memorial Library because it was founded by the Dalai Lama in Tenzin. And he just died while I was there. And it houses many sacred books and it's um, in a place where many people can access them. So it's a very important library. The little kids, the little Hindu kids, the little Buddhist kids, the little Sikh kids are all in there looking for books because the farmers don't own books. If a kid wants a child's book to read, he has to go to the library. So we have everybody's kids. We have a whole floor of children's books. And they get to read. And they don't have books in the house. Neither Tibetan, Tibetans have religious texts in the house wrapped up in a special room. But they don't have just books to read. So for the kids, even the little monastery kids, this makes a big difference. They can go read about stories, picture books, and watching how happy they are to have books. It's not like you have to force them to read. It's like, oh, cool, look at this. Okay. Also, I've got some really cool stuff to put in it. I'll bring it tomorrow. Good. Um, the Tibetan house is sponsored by a wonderful woman who pays for the electricity and the air conditioning. This is the box if you want to put five dollars in it for them. Hey, please do that, guys. If we didn't have this place, we wouldn't have this teaching. Yeah. And I hope it's way too there. hot to do it in a cafe yeah. outside. <laughs> Yes, we're good. Bye, guys.